Hey, hello everyone, and um, thank you very much for joining us for this Q&A to accompany the Braintree Museum exhibition about the Courtauld family and the legacy of the textile company in the area. My name's Catherine Dunleavy, I'm the National Programme Coordinator at the Courtauld Gallery, and I'm very pleased to say I'm joined by my colleague Dr Rachel Sloan, Assistant Curator of Works on Paper at the Courtauld, to have a look at a very special part of the exhibition, um, four prints by the artist Paul Gauguin. Um, the reason we've included them in the exhibition is that they were purchased by Samuel Courtauld, who was one of the chairmen of the textile company in the 1920s and 30s, but also um, contributed to the founding of the Courtauld Institute and donated much of his art collection to the Courtauld Gallery. So we're gonna have a closer look at these prints today and we're gonna answer some of the questions that you've sent us over the last couple of weeks. Um, but before we get started, I think Rachel wanted to show us some images, so I'll let her share her screen and some of the slides. Okay. All right, is that, is that, is that up? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so thanks again for joining us. And um, just wanted to... <laughs> Delighted to be able to answer your questions. Yeah, great. Um, well, just to kick us off, I wanted to start with a really broad question that kind of looks at um, why we uh, are interested in Gauguin in the first place. So can you tell us a bit about why he's an important artist? Wow, that's a really big question. Um, we could, I could potentially be here all afternoon answering that, but um, I'll, try to, I'll try to narrow it down to just a, a, a few things about him. Um, so he's, Gauguin is an important artist for, um, for several major reasons. Um, and I've, I've, chose, I've chosen um, to show you this painting by him in the National Gallery of Scotland and, and Edinburgh because it encapsulates a lot of them. So as a, as a post-impressionist uh, painter, um, his experimental and non-naturalistic use of color and flattened forms, such as you can see here, uh, really helped pave the way for uh, abstraction. Um, as, a, as a member of the symbolist movement, he championed the importance of an artist's uh, subjective inner vision um, rather than um, believing that artists should just try to re record the external appearance of the world. Uh, he was also the first European artist to make extensive and systematic use of the imagery and the stylistic qualities of non-Western art in his own work. Um, also very relevant to, the, to our exhibition, um, as a printmaker, he played a really important role in reviving and reshaping the art of woodcut. And it's for these reasons, among others, that he was greatly admired by um, artists such as Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso. Great, thank you. And um, yeah, you mentioned the four kind of prints in Braintree. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about those, when he made them and, and why? Of course. So um, the, the, the prints on, on view in, in Braintree are part of a set of 10 prints that Gauguin made in um, late 1893, early 1894. Um, which was shortly after he re returned from France, returned to France from his first trip to Tahiti. And he created them originally to uh, illustrate a book called Noa Noa, which means fragrant in Tahitian. And this was intended to be a memoir of his time in Tahiti, uh, although I'm using the word memoir rather loosely because we now know that many of the uh, incidents that he described in the book were either highly embellished or totally made up. Um, the book was also meant to provide a French audience with a, a key to understanding the unfamiliar subject matter of the paintings he'd made in Tahiti. Um, so he, he needed to sell them and he knew that a baffled art collector was quite unlikely to buy them. Um, however, for various reasons, the book wasn't published during Gauguin's lifetime, but the prints themselves took on a life of their own. Uh, he started exhibiting them and selling them um, quite separately from the book in 1894. And perhaps that's not surprising because he actually didn't leave any indication of how exactly the prints relate to the text or even the order in which they were meant to appear. Right. Um, and it's great to see the prints because the next question um, from Polly um, is about the sort of the unusual appearance, maybe. She said it doesn't, they don't really look like other prints that she's seen. So were there any um, sort of special techniques or unusual approaches? Well, that's a really good question. They certainly don't look like um, other woodblock prints, and there's a very good reason for that. And the main one is that Gauguin actually used a hybrid of two different techniques to make them. The first of these is woodcut, um, which is the oldest known printmaking method. 
So woodcut uses a variety of blades and chisels, um, some of which are illustrated here, um, to carve a design in relief. That is, it, it stands proud of the, the rest of the block. And the other technique he used to produce these prints is wood engraving, which was a relatively new technique. It had been invented at the beginning of the 19th century. And wood engraving actually uses the same tools as, um, as copper plate engraving, um, such as a, 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 a tool called a, a burin or a graver, um, which I've also illustrated here. And this, these, this, this tool is used to incise very, very fine lines into the block. And in Gauguin's day, uh, wood engraving was uh, valued for its precision and fine detail. But in these prints, he, he turned these qualities on their head. Um, so in addition to these two techniques, he also used some very unconventional tools like razor blades or etching needles or sandpaper to achieve a whole range of te different textural effects. And this range of tools and techniques created surfaces, as you can see here, that look more like relief sculptures than um, conventional printing blocks. And it meant, among other things, that um, actually making prints from these blocks was a really, really tricky business. And it's actually quite interesting to note that the, the prints in the, the Courtauld collection um, were actually not printed by Gauguin himself, but by his son, Pola, after Gauguin's death. Um, uh, Pola himself was an artist, but it took him a total of two years to figure out just how to, how to make prints from the blocks. Great, thanks, that's really interesting. Um, and I guess on a, a similar sort of vein to the, them looking quite unusual, um, I think one of the things that we get asked quite a lot, or certainly were asked a lot when the exhibition was open, and especially by school groups, is what do the prints actually depict? What kind of stories um, and myths are, are they trying to, to show us? Uh, well, they, um, they depict uh, primarily um, creation and origin myths um, of, of Tahiti. Um, However, as to where, as to where, um, where these myths came from and where, where Gauguin learned about them, that's a somewhat complicated question. Uh, in, in the manuscript of, of his memoir, Noah Noah, he, he claimed that he learned about the myths that he depicted in the prints and in his, his paintings directly from indigenous Tahitians, in, especially from uh, a, um, a girl named Tehamana, who was his, um, his, his, um, his companion, his, his, his wife, um, while he was there. But the truth is actually much less glamorous. He actually um, seems to have learned um, most of his Tahitian mythology from European sources. Um, before he even set out for Tahiti, he, he, read, um, he read a couple of books about, um, about the, um, the, the culture and the mythology. One was by a Belgian explorer named Jacques-Antoine Morenhout. And the other was by a French naval officer and cartographer named um, Edmond de Bovis. And so he was really getting his, um, his Tahitian mythology second or even third hand. Uh, and neither of these books was illustrated. And many of the, the sculptures of the carvings that they, that they described no longer existed by the time that Gauguin arrived in Tahiti. Um, Tahiti had been a French colony since the 1880, since, since 1880 and, um, missionaries uh, came in and tried to, um, did, did their best to replace the um, indigenous religion with Christianity. So there really weren't a lot of visual sources available to him. Um, so his representations of these myths in the prints are mostly the product of his, his reading of these European sources and his own imagination, um, as well as um, the influence of imagery from other Pacific and Asian cultures, such as Easter Island or New Zealand, or Java, um, as well as uh, a whole array of European sources. So his Tahitian prints can certainly be appreciated as works of art, but please, please, please do not look to them as anthropological documents. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a mix of resources there, very uh, international, sort of uh, internationally pulled together. <laughs> um, thinking about kind of Gauguin's work uh, more broadly, I think one thing people usually associate him with is, is kind of his big, very colourful paintings like the one you started us off with. Um, you mentioned he did other prints. Um, can you tell us a bit about other mediums that he worked in? Was it mainly just painting or did he do other works too? Uh, well, actually, Gauguin worked in pretty much every medium you could think of. Um, he came to printmaking pretty late in his career. He made his first prints, of which these three are um, examples. 
1889, when he'd already been um, working as a full-time artist for about a, about a decade. Um, but actually, once he got started with printmaking, he, he, he kept going pretty much until the end of his career. Um, these first prints that he made were rosinkographs, which is a variation on lithography, but um, from the Noah Noah prints onward, he, um, he, um, he favored this, um, this hybrid technique of wood, wood cut and wood engraving that, um, that we've just been discussing. And as far as other types of art, um, as, I, yeah, as I mentioned, there's really nothing he left untouched. He, he painted, he drew, he made prints, he made ceramics, uh, he sculpted in a huge variety of materials, including clay, metal, wood, stone, and even shell. And he brought the same unorthodox approach to all of them that we've seen him um, bring to printmaking. Um, and it's, what's actually quite interesting about Goga is that he often would address the same subjects, same, same kind of imagery in multiple media. Uh, he really regarded himself as a complete artist and he didn't draw firm distinctions between different art forms. Great. Um, and we've kind of touched a little bit on um, him having a, a wife in Tahiti. Uh, we had a question from Alice um, kind of about this, about some of the controversy. Um, she said, people um, often criticize Gauguin's relationship with women and girls. And um, so should we still display his work and, and talk about him as an artist? Well, that is a really tough question uh, for which there are no easy answers, but equally, I don't think it's one that we can afford to avoid. Um, I don't think that most people would question the, the quality um, or the importance of Gauguin's work. But I also agree that there's absolutely no question that Gauguin treated pretty much, treated pretty much everyone who crossed his path very badly, but particularly women and girls. Um, his treatment of women was, was really egregious, um, even, even by the standards of, of his day, which admittedly were looser than ours. Um, he, he cheated on his wife and then ultimately abandoned her. Uh, in Tahiti and in the Marquesas, he, um, he cultivated relationships with, with girls who were, who were underage, even by the standards of the 19th century. Um, and these relationships could really only be described of, as um, exploitative. Um, but at the same time, it's just as important to acknowledge that Gauguin's behavior didn't arise out of a vacuum. Um, it was rooted in and it reflects uh, attitudes and assumptions about, um, about relationships between men and women and between Europe and the rest of the world that were, that were very commonplace at the time and, and unfortunately are still with us in, in some form today. And for that reason, I don't think that canceling Goga, as is, is, um, is often spoken about today, is, is useful or even desirable. I think instead that Gauguin's work and, it, and the historical background that it, um, it grew out of, um, however unpleasant, deserve to be scrutinized and, and heavily um, questioned uh, rather than being swept under, under the rug. I think it should still be exhibited, um, but I think equally that we have a responsibility to acknowledge its ugly underside. I would also like to note that um, many artists and writers and critics today are, ac are actually um, engaging with Gauguin's work in this, in this, um, in this very um, um, constru constructive and questioning way that I've, I've just described and responding to it in really creative ways. And, um, and, and it, it's quite interesting to note that actually a number of these, the artists who are responding to his work now are of um, Polynesian heritage, um, two examples here. Oh, great, that's really interesting. And yeah, it's so important to sort of ask those harder questions and, and sort of have a look at things from these different perspectives, isn't it? And um, so, um, kind of almost going back to the introduction now, um, I mentioned that these works are connected to Samuel Courtauld, and that's kind of the basis of um, the exhibition. And um, so, you and asked us uh, a little bit more about that. And what was it about Samuel Courtauld's, um, what did Samuel Courtauld like, sorry, about Gauguin's work? What attracted him to buying Gauguin? Oh, this is a question that I, I wish I could, you know, I, I wish I could time travel to, in order to answer it. Because the, the truth is that although Courtauld clearly adored Gauguin's work, he's one of the, the best represented, represented artists in his, in his collection. He doesn't seem to have spoken or written much about exactly why he liked his work so much, which is really frustrating. So it means we can really only speculate about, him, about what it was about Gauguin that, that so appealed to him. 
And I think if we, if we look at the way that Gauguin's work fits into his, um, into Courtauld's collection as a whole, I think it's fair to say that Gauguin's, um, Gauguin's innovative and sensuous use of color and the, the sense of poetry and mystery in his paintings and prints was probably what struck a chord with, with Courtauld. Um, what we do know about Courtauld's taste in Gauguin's work is that it did evolve somewhat in the years that he was collecting. Um, because he didn't actually hold on to every single um, work by Gauguin that he bought. Um, he, actually, he actually sold two paintings that he, um, that he, that he bought um, before he ended up giving his collection to the Cultural Institute. Um, luckily for us, um, both of these paintings ended up in public collections. One is in the Barber Institute in Birmingham and the other is in the National Gallery of Scotland in Edinburgh. So, um, so the public can still enjoy um, the pictures that Courtauld decided not to hang on to for whatever reason. Great. And um, kind of following on from that then, to sort of wrap up a little bit, if people want to uh, to find out more and have a look at some more of these works, um, does the Courtauld Gallery still have other Gauguins? Is that a good place to go and have a look at some? Well, it's probably the best place in the UK to see Gauguin's work, um, to, be, to, be, to be quite frank. Um, we have so we um, we have three paintings by Gauguin, um, Nevermore, which I which um which I just showed you, um, as well as the, the haystacks and Terrarioa, um, as well as a sculpted, a uh, very rare and unusual uh, sculpted portrait of his of his wife Netta, as well as um, ten prints, four of which are um, on view in Braintree, and um, two drawings, and the paintings and sculptures are going to and sculpture are going to be exhibited in the gallery when it reopens uh, in twenty twenty one. And the paint and the, the prints and drawings will be available to view in our uh, prints and drawings study room. So I very much hope that you all come and come and see them when we reopen. Great. Well, that's a really nice note to end on. Um, and thank you so much um, for answering some of those questions that uh, people have obviously been very keen to, to follow up on and ask. And um, I just want to finish um, by uh, letting everyone know that the um, exhibition, although it is currently closed, um, is mainly available online. You can have a look at the prints and some of the other works, uh, as well as some other resources as well. So if you go to the Braintree Museum website, you can have a look at that. Um, and this event and the exhibition are all part of our national partners programme at the Quartal with projects across the UK. So if you'd like to find out a little bit more, um, you can also head over to our national partners website. Um, and we cover all the different projects as well as um, other resources and different ways to find out more about our work there too. Um, but for now, um, that is all we have time for. But thanks again to Rachel for her time and sharing her expertise. And we very much hope that in the future, uh, we'll be able to get back to Braintree and deliver some more events in person there. But thank you very much for everyone who's taken the time to watch this and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you.